So, Richard is going to tell us about uh, Jurassic Park and uh, how he's becoming Steven Spielberg, and it's going to be amazing. And uh, maybe yeah. there'll be some flatback too. And how all our users are going to be eaten by dinosaurs. Um, yeah, this is my, my third and possibly final Guadeg talk, because um, <laughs> I don't think they'll let me back after this. Um, and yeah, I've got an unusual disclaimer. This is me talking personally about my feeling about these technologies. This isn't the Open SUSE opinion. This isn't the SUSE opinion. Um, especially with Open SUSE, we're the kind of community where if anybody disagrees with me, we'll still accept their pull requests. So, you know, this is my list of concerns and worries about where we're going with these technologies. Not necessarily the authoritative, you know, this distro hates them entirely. Um, and yeah, we need to start in the beginning, and, and very weirdly, at, especially at a Guadec, I never thought I'd be starting a presentation with a Windows 95 architecture diagram. <laughs> um, but uh, th this is actually kind of where I started with these technologies. I, I somehow stumbled on this and, and looking at it and was thinking about you know, the old-fashioned problems of, of Windows DLL hell, where you know, back in the day, if you were a Windows developer, you ended up having to dev and test all of your apps with every possible DLL combination that could possibly be in production on someone's machine anywhere. And then retest every single patch with all those different combinations. And then test every possible patch that anybody could be putting on that combination. And then even when you did everything possibly, well, you'd cry anyway, because it always broke. And that's why I stopped doing anything on Windows. Um, basically, but Windows 2000 had this wonderful idea, side-by-side -side assembly, which was basically DLL cont containerization. And the idea that a every single application and its DLLs could have its own separate memory space, not that dissimilar from some of the stuff we now have in the kernel, and private DLLs would be loaded from an application directory. Um, it wasn't perfect, and they ended up bolting on this sort of Windows file protection to separately isolate their system DLLs. And of course, they had lots of user applications that needed to be migrated across. So they had this lovely little tool which basically containerized or packed up all of your DLLs for your old application, and bang, you suddenly have a new style MSI, a new style Windows app, and, and you know everything's fine and wonderful. They also had a very fancy feature where, with Windows 2000, they bundled a bunch of, of sort of cut down environments where a developer could just target the specific environment they were interested in, such as Windows 32 or POSIX or OS2, and not have to worry too much about bundling in additional stuff. They could just build for that lovely subsystem. You know, there was some independencies between them, but you know, just build for that lovely subsystem and run your application and everything's fine. And then I saw this. <laughs> and it reminded me. Um, but yeah, jumping ahead of myself, Windows thought everything would be fine. But it wasn't. It didn't work that way. You know, Windows 2000 applications were and remain to this day you know, a security nightmare. You end up with security relevant DLLs lurking in countless application folders all over the place. Less technical and sort of more practical about it, it is a maintenance nightmare. How do you end up updating an application in Windows? Still, to this day, you have 20 different updaters all handling their various different uh, way of updating their various different tied up application. And it's also very often a legal problem of, of figuring out, can we legally distribute all of these DLLs that we want to put in our application? Um, but storage vendors are happy because everybody's using up more disk space. So, you know, it's not all bad. Back in 2000, meanwhile in Linux land, we were looking on smugly and happily and, you know, thinking everything was perfect as well because we have Linux distributions. And I'm kind of going to brush over the technical stuff and, and, and stick with the sort of main value add that dist I think distributions really bring to this picture, which boils down to security, maintenance, and legal overview of what they are shipping. Because the distribution is the one shipping it, so it's their responsibility to get these things right. You know, a decent distribution that has a security team auditing their code, monitoring CVEs. They've also li likely signed up to embargoed lists so they can actually you know, worry about CVEs before they're public. And then making sure those patches get out to users as fast as they can do it. Generally speaking, not just security-wise, keeping those packages in their distribution repos, packaged, up-to-date, delivering to users. 
And a surprisingly often forgotten part, making sure that the licenses are being complied with for all this various free software. You know, free software licensing is very, very important. And yet we all have different choices of different licenses that we like, and they all have different compatibility matrices, and you know, there's always different terms and conditions, and that stuff can get very, very, very complicated and very, very, very messy. And distributions cut through all of that and f try their best to find some way of actually shipping something at the end of it all. Quick, quick aside, just generally speaking about you know shared libraries and dependencies, you know which is typically how distributions are doing things. One set of libraries because we don't want to have many many copies. It's not just a case of using less space on disk, which is you know the technical argument for having shared libraries really, but it, it ties into all of those more organisational aspects as well. It's less of a footprint for you to worry about security-wise. You've got less insecure libraries if you're shipping less libraries. You need less manpower to keep all those packages maintained and updated, and it's a, little, it's a fair bit easier to review and ensure the license compliance for all of that. So everything's fine with the distro model, right? Well, no. You know, there are very, very real problems. It's not a perfect model. If it did, technologies like Flatpak, Snappy, and AppImage wouldn't exist. Um, compatibility you know, is a very, very real problem. Most distributions don't agree on what versions of what libraries and what applications to have in their repositories. And many applications need different libraries and no one agrees they're sort of a layer down either. And it, it, you know, an application developer doesn't want to have to worry about getting their application running with some random collection of dependencies that some distribution's chosen. But application developers aren't the ones in the current model really worrying about that. That's what distributions are doing. A healthy distribution has a fair number of maintainers taking care of that anyway. The distribution of work generally works. It's not perfect, but it generally works, and that is what distribution maintainers are doing to this day. But just because the application's there doesn't mean it's portable. And, and you know, uh, uh, you know, doesn't mean it's going to work on these you know random collection of library and toolkits. And this is where sort of the sticking point ties in, where we have applications that you know work wonderfully fine on one distribution, and some poor maintainer gets stuck because they can't get those libraries and toolkits running, you know, in a different distribution because of some other choice the distributions made. Application developers don't want to worry about that, but like I say, generally speaking, distributions are fighting this fight and pushing this through and making this thing mostly work most of the time. But part of the way we do that very often is by slowing the distribution down. You know, this, this, you know, we have a fixed release schedule and you know, we're deciding the pace that we, the distribution, wants to ship because we think we know better than the upstreams. Um, and I actually think this is totally wrong. I think the, role, the regular release model isn't the right way to be doing a Linux distribution. Um, because it holds back the applications from the users. Um, so, you know, it, it gets in the way. Application developers don't worry about it, but they don't like it. Rolling releases do blow this problem out of the water, and the problem does eventually go away if we get more people doing rolling releases and doing them properly. But regardless of my opinion, you know, we are living in the future, and there are these technologies like Flatback, AppImage, and Snappy that are there to try and address this in their own way by bundling together the application with their libraries. And I'm talking generally about all three of these at the moment, and I'll get to Flatpak properly in a minute. Uh, you know, because generally speaking, they all try and solve the same big things. You know, they're trying to solve that compatibility problem. They're trying to put only the, the libraries you need in a bundle so you can just get the thing working. It tries to be portable so it can work on every single distribution. It's the dream. It's therefore meant to be able to enable de application developers and upstreams to distribute at their own pace, and it should just work. That's, you know, that's the big promise. But I'm you know, starting with the compatibility and portability part, whichever technology ends up with some stack diagram like this, where the containerized bit you know, has a line which below you just kind of magically call the OS or enablement or whatever. And everything below that line is just assumed by the chosen containerized app technology. Where that line is drawn differs between Flatpak, Snappy, and AppImage. But that line's always there. 
In the case of flat pack, the line's pretty much just drawn at the kernel. You know, the assumption everything above that is going to be in some runtime or, yeah, mostly speaking, in some runtime. Okay, that that makes my point even worse. Actually. Okay, so you assume kernel and X server and Wayland and a few other things. Yeah, yeah, it could it could change. Yeah, see, you know, there's assumptions made which these technologies assume above that. Snappy depends on which base application, you know, which base application you're using. Flatpak depends on what's being bundled in that particular, uh, sorry, the app image. Depends what's being bundled in that particular app image. That means that if the assumptions are made. The as whatever, wh whichever technology is assuming, some, everything below that stack is going to be consistent and the same across every single distribution. Come on. We've never agreed on anything. I mean, we compile our kernels in different ways. We choose different options. We, yeah, we mess up our compilers. Um, you know, we, we mess around with glibc. There, there's no consistency there whatsoever, sadly. I think that's something we should fix. But that means that the same compatibility problems that are driving the desire for these technologies are still there. They're going to be hopefully less. They're going to happen less often, but they are still going to happen. And they're likely to be happening in more scary places when they do, because they'll be living in you know, lurking in kernel and display servers and other parts, which distributions aren't going to be that keen to change on the hoof when they're halfway through one of their regular release schedules. And that's going to end up with very nasty problems of how do you then, you know, how do we then get those problems fixed? Um, it's one thing that I really like with AppImage is they're refreshingly honest about this problem because their documentation just says, you know, give up now as you're writing it. Um, you, know, you, you know, they very clearly say you can only target your application for a subset of distributions, pick that, bundle just that, basically don't make the assumptions, analyze it yourself. But then you haven't got a portable application that can run everywhere. You've got a portable application that can run on a few targeted distributions that you've bothered to do your homework on. And if you just make these assumptions, expect crashes. If you don't bundle everything in you're going to need, you know, you, chances are something will break at some point. So it's hopeless. Well, no. You know, it's one thing that I really do like with Flatback is the runtime model tries to address this. By trying to push that line lower and lower down, by putting more and more in runtimes, you know, you've at least, yeah, doing your best to bundle the whole thing together and make that vulnerability as, as small as possible. Um, but really, even with that, I think the real solution is, is needs, a needs a whole set of negotiation between the major distributions and these uh, containerized application developers to figure out some kind of commonality on those pain points. And AppImage already have a list of their pain points, in fact, which is rather comprehensive and I think a good starting point for these discussions where we can get around and say, okay, make some changes here, tune things up in, you know, so we can start making those assumptions in a way that will actually work. Because without that, in reality, yeah, the compatibility problem isn't solved with these tools. The portability problem isn't solved with these tools. It's made better, but not solved. And well, the pace of change, yeah, it does actually work. You know, it, you can deliver whatever you want in these tools as fast as you want. That's the point. It does that very, very well. But you can't say that it's just going to work. You know, hopefully, but not always. And now thinking back to you know the Windows 2000 example, are we just creating in a, a situation of you know the same future as Windows 2000 had? Are we going to end up with security relevant libraries lurking in countless bundles all over the place? Yeah. Who's going to be maintaining those? Who's going to be patching them, monitoring the CVEs, making sure they're all up to date for each and every lib, which you're probably going to have more of them because you're going to have more libraries in more bundles. Who's going to be checking the licenses and the license compatibility between all of those libraries and those applications? Right now, that's a very, very murky situation with the applications that I've been looking at. Um, and there's some very, very worrying questions that, that bubble up when you start looking at it. But of course, storage vendors are going to be happy. You know, these do take up a little bit more disk space. This is good. You know, I want to get a bigger SSD anyway. And generally speaking, the kind of feeling that I get when I look at these technologies is they exist to take more of the responsibility away from distributions. I'm fine with that, but there needs to therefore be an understanding of exactly what those responsibilities are. 
you know, that you know, this isn't you know, if you're bundling these app in these application tools, these are your problems that typically distributions have been taken care of for ten, you know, 10, 20 years. So on the case of the application and portability side of things, you know, whatever tool you're using, Flatpak, Snappy, or AppImage, you need to worry about what do you put in there. Flatpak, luckily, with Builder, at least makes all this automatic. But you know, in the case of AppImage and Snappy, you've got to worry about this. You know, do you, you know, what do you put in there? What do you bundle with it? You know, where do you make that assumption? If the ABI is going to change, possibly, and break anything, put it in there, which means you're going to end up with bigger and bigger modules to worry about, but you need to worry about it. When you then start putting it out in the real world, you know, you're still going to have and develop and test it and worry about it for every single distribution and potentially every single patch on every distribution. Hopefully, it won't change that often. The bar will be lower. The chance of in in incidents will be less. But it will still happen. It will still break anyway. And in the case of Flatpak, you've also got to worry about keeping up with your various runtime release as well, which is actually kind of like another layer of confusion with the thing. You know, got to worry about the distribution and make sure that your, you know, your chosen runtime is also still there. And then dev and test that combination and make sure it all still works. And then hopefully, don't cry too much, but when it breaks, yeah, there, go there it goes. And then from the technical back to the sort of organizational stuff, you will need to worry about reacting to CVEs rapidly so your users aren't impacted. I know there's this, the sand, you know, I know there's sandboxing, I know there's those tools, but the reality is every single sandboxing technology we've implemented in Linux in the last 20 years has been breached and has been escaped from. You know, VMs aren't a wonderful panacea to this. You know, it, they're great for mitigation, but they aren't enough to rely on. Um, so, you know, you're still going to have to worry about it and you still need to deal with these things as fast as you can because the mitigation is just giving you that time to, you know, let the users patch. You can't just bank on it and say, oh, it'll be fine, I'll do it next week. That also means keeping up with the maintenance of all those individual libraries and bundle everything else bundled in there. And, of course, it also means being very, very thorough and very, very concerned about the legal compatibility of those licenses in all of those bundles all tied together. So what are we going to do about it? We being, you know, distributions. I think every distribution should like these technologies. You know, ultimately, it's going to be less work for us. This is a good thing. Um, you know, it's always going to be a good thing. And you know, I'm starting here trying to kind of convey the transfer of responsibility so people start worrying about these things. And I think we should be engaging more and more to get, you know, to, to get everybody on the same page and start addressing these issues. Now these technologies are starting to grow up and get to the point where we need to start worrying about this stuff. I've already mentioned that I think distributions, you know, need to also get together themselves and sort ourselves out when it comes to this commonality problem. You know, we tried before in the past with the with the LSB. It didn't work because you know the LSB was way too broad. These technologies make that problem smaller. It does lower the bar. You know, it has to be lower down the stack. So maybe we can finally agree at least on certain commonalities in our kernel configs and certain commonalities in how we do glibc. And maybe therefore we can make this problem way less and way less of an issue to enable these technologies to work properly. And also, just generally speaking, I see a lot of uh, a trend. Actually, luckily not with Flatback, but with with other <laughs> other tooling of uh, you know just reinventing the wheel for the sake of reinventing the wheel. When in fact, in these distributions, we've got tools and talent and techniques where we've been doing this for years. You know, adopting them, using things like the build service and, and you know the open, the open build service, and you know just taking care of of learning what we can from the, the you know, from 20 years of distribution building and transferring that to this new context <coughs> where the, many of the problems are still there. You know, they're just somebody else's problem now. And also, thinking very much from the distribution perspective, I'm starting to wonder actually how, much, how big a problem all this is anyway. Um, you know, more and more you know, distributions are fundamentally changing the nature of a Linux distribution. Um, I've already said my personal opinion is rolling regular releases should go the way of the dodo, and rolling releases are a f you know a far better way of the you know the world running, especially when you tie it to transactional distributions like Atomic or SUSE's Casp or Open SUSE's Cubic distributions. All of these distributions where you have you know a read-only file system, Atomic updates, you know, nice, tidy, polished. Well, if you're doing that 
you've got a nicer delivery system for the rolling release without potentially risking stuff for your users. If you do that and also tie it with user space applications in Flatpak, you've got a really sort of you know, exciting combination. Um, but it also you know, waters down the, the nature of this problem in the first place because you can deliver, you know, in Tumbleweed, for example, you can deliver the entire stack of GNOME on the day of release. You're, there's no delay. And that's fully tested and fully integrated and all nicely polished. Um, you know, without having to worry about hacking that into your various flatback runtimes, or you know, dealing with Qt integration, or you know, all those other, all those other problems, and the security and the maintenance and the legal issues, they're still there. But it's more of a known quantity in the distribution model. Um, you know, so you know, the work's already done, the tooling's already there, the people are already there. So you know. It's a bit of an aside because I still think you know we want to convey about whether these technologies are going to be adopted anyway, but it does make me wonder. Just you know, I accept the trigger point of you know distributions are bad, therefore we need this, but distributions have changed and are changing fundamentally. So will we end up in a world where we really need it in the end anyway? And this yeah, this is kind of where this comes in because with OpenSUSE we're in this weird and wonderful situation where we're changing our distributions. You know, we've still got a regular release, which is you know actually becoming more and more stable, and we're you know innovating on the rolling release side of things, innovating on the transactional release side of things, and of course we've got lots of tooling and building and open QA. So we have situations like AppImage actively collaborating with us and now working in a build service where you can build any package in the build service, be that a Debian, an RPM, or whatever, and build an entire app image out of the thing you know, at a click of a button. Which basically means you can benefit, or the app image developers can benefit immediately from all those packages already being audited, already being update and dependency complete, and all the licensing's already done. And it's there, it works, it's happy. You know, they're, they're very happy with it. Um, and it also means the app developer just has to then put that a little bit on top of you know, their latest version. And surprisingly, I never thought I'd have a side that said this, Canonical are working with other people. Yeah, including us. Um, Snappy's catching up with that too. You know, they are actively engaging with distributions like us and actively adopting an upstream first mentality when it comes to all of the enablement required to get snaps into the distribution, but also to get those distributions as a bigger part of the snap ecosystem. Um, you know, the, the biggest, from a technical perspective, snap and, and, and app image, uh, sorry, snap and flatback have a lot in common. Um, because you know, Snap's now pushing this whole concept of, of base snaps, which basically are exactly the same as flatback runtimes. But there's one subtle difference. <coughs> Canonical are pushing the developers to be the base snap maintainers. You know, they're maintaining their ones the first themselves, and they're trying to get Fedora to do one, and then they're trying to get OpenSUSE to do them. That leverages all the known quantities of these legal and, tech and maintenance issues that we talked about because we already do that. It won't be too much extra work for us to go that road. So it makes it easier for us to support Snap than anything else, which is kind of weird because um, I'm not really used to that. Um, and yeah, there's a few blockers in there, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the, the, yeah, the tone, the change really does make that quite a compelling option for being sort of a middle ground between the crazy, unsecure lunacy of app image and you know, the other options. Regardless of the technology, I still think that, or, or which technology, I still think there are some very, very serious issues with this approach. You know, I think dependency hell is going to, you know, going to sting these technologies hard. You know, I've already talked about the, sort of the assumptions of, of what's below the stack. And also within these various tools, you know, how do you do dependency resolution? You know, right now it's quite easy to say, you know, okay, this snap depends on that snap, but how, you know, how does it work when you end up chaining four or five different of these snaps together? You know, at least Flatpak keeps it simple, one application, one runtime mostly, but you know, it's yeah, it's a problem that will grow. And the security and the sandboxing and app license app, app isolation side of things is still a mess. I actually, from a technical perspective, prefer Snap's approach. I think AppArmor is awesome, and it's more generic when it comes, you know, it doesn't require a desktop environment to be, you know, to be doing it properly. But unfortunately, despite me thinking it's awesome, all the cool stuff is in patches they haven't put upstream yet. Yet. 
Um, I ranted about this really, really hard when I had a chance at them. And they promised me now they're going to do everything upstream first from now on. And I will hopefully be able to say that I believe them in kernel 4.16. Um, until then, I kind of leave the option open. But if they do that, you know, we will have sn full snap support in OpenSUSE the next day. Um, and probably be building a whole bunch of stuff in there because we're really just waiting for that to be in the kernel for us to use it. You know, Flatpak takes a completely different approach with this. You know, the, the, the portal approach with bubble wrap, it's great, but I think it, it's too desktop orientated and kind of ruins the chance of using Flatpak for anything other than desktop apps, which, yeah, is both a blessing and a curse. And yeah, app image doesn't do anything here. Um, you know, they say you can run an application in Fire Jail, but no, it doesn't do anything here. I'd, I'd like to see all these technologies think about actually basing everything on app, Im uh, on app armor, because the model of app armor where it's relatively easy to write an additional profile for a specific application and ship that profile with that application is you know, just easier and more flexible than the current options there and more universal than Flatpak's very desktop oriented approach. And now just about Flatpak. Dear Flatpak, I worry you're falling behind the other two. Um, you know, App Image now has a smoother build story than you've got. You're getting there with FlatHub and everything else, but you know, App Image has you know, <laughs> come out of nowhere and caught up with you. And Snappy's working very, 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 very hard to catch up. Canonical, work, I'm really surprised how keen they are to get this up and running. I don't think it's hopeless. And as a GNOME guy, I actually want Flatpak to win. And I'll get more to that in a minute. But right now, I, out of the three, I kind of feel that Flatpak's being the one that's left behind and isn't keeping up with the rest of the world. And also, these, slide, these next slides weren't actually in here until I was here, because you know, we've been at Guardec for three days now. There's been lots of talk about Flatpak, and part of me is really, really excited. But I couldn't help but ask myself, who does Flatpak actually help? Because I'm not convinced it helps app developers. You know, the, it's, they're still having to worry about dependencies in their runtimes and their distributions. They're having to learn new, complicated, not deb or not RPM packaging formats. It, you know, we just heard in the QT talk, it can be quite invasive to get Flatpak support in your application. You know, you have to do some work to make, to enable your app to actually be Flatpakable. And okay, Builder helps a ton. Builder's awesome, but if you don't like Builder, you know, then it's really quite scary as an application developer to flat pack all your stuff. If you're a stack developer, so I mean, like GNOME or, or like KDE, does flat pack actually help you? You've got to worry about a lot more about integration, or you've got to worry a lot about integration. You've got a lot of worry about the maintenance and security and the legal issues. You have to worry a lot more about UX. These are all GNOME strengths, so I totally get why as GNOME, we love Flatpak. But not every stack is GNOME. And I think these points are the ones that will hold back the adoption of Flatpak. Because they need, you know, those are what runtime maintainers will need to worry about and panic about and maintain over a long time. And we need to make those answers less scary, you know, the answers that easier and less scary and more, straight, and more straightforward. And ultimately, like, what about the users? You know, Right now, we're living in a world with devs and RPMs. You know, what about the education of teaching people about the new tooling? How easy is it going to be to get these applications? It's one thing that I really like with Flatter, but I think that's part of the answer to this, of you know, simplifying all of that. But, ah, done. Um, but ultimately, if we do this wrong and we deliver these applications too, you know, too quickly without the proper testing, without the proper quality control, without the proper legal and other checks, we end up in a situation where our users are the ones that actually suffer. You know, they're going to get those new versions with those new bugs or with their incompatible licenses too quickly, too early, and then we've got a mess. You know, once it's there, you've really got to worry about it. So today, I think the only people that Flatpak helps are distribution builders. Thank you. Yeah, because we're going to have less work, but I really don't just care about myself. I do worry about you know, everybody else as well, um, particularly the users. Uh, I do think we need to sort of worry about these more general issues. I've also got a couple of, of, of technical niggles with, with Flatpak. Again, this is like, I don't know, and it's groaning for me. But 
Um, but this, I, I, was, I was told that my, from my security guys, I must moan about this at least once on stage. So, you know, that's it. The portals and the, e and, like, the exports, you know, it, I get it. It's cool. It's a very cool way of doing things. Our security guys at SUSE dread it because it's a ton of responsibility going to, you know, relatively new code, which they don't trust. And that lack of trust, that lack of certainty, also the kind of lack of clarification of, you know, what are the constraints of these portals are what's really holding back the adoption of, of diving in with, with you know, portals getting into tumbleweed quickly. Because um, like right now, um, like during Alex's talk, like all of the current behavior of these portals is totally sane, um, give or take. I mean, there's been a few adjustments, but, you know, but there's nowhere is that strictly defined, nowhere is that clearly documented. Um, and that, that's really making, especially our more enterprise security team, very, very nervous about the adoption of this stuff. Because they don't want to put it, they don't want to in potentially enable our users to go and install something that will then, you know, hijack their machine and you know, have a field day with it just because some rogue application's gone in. Yeah, but we, but we audit our RPMs, we can't. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, could you not apply app armor to the portals? Like, if you have some like, oh, this is an untrusted app image, let's lock it down. Yeah. Just do that to the portals. We could We're done, right? <laughs> yeah, we definitely could. But that's but doing that work is one of the reasons why we've you know we haven't got as much support for Flatpak in our distribution today as we want to have. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't completely disagree, but but it's <laughs> like you're holding the flat packs to a different standard than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah no, I. I uh, yeah, I'd s we're holding flat packs to a higher standard than than our own RPMs. Yeah, because when we, we throw a whole bunch of warnings up to our users about in installing unsigned RPMs and blah 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 blah, you know, we don't quite have the same tooling and fake capability for doing that with flat pack just yet. So until in, you know, until the ecosystem kind of evolves to help that stuff, these are the worries that we're going to be bubbling up. So that's it. And then, yeah, generally speaking, you know, back to the kind of less technical stuff and the more general ecosystem worries, I'm going back to the earlier point, you know, at GNOME we had, you know, beginning of Quadec, Alan did that great presentation of, you know, what are the key values of GNOME? You know, GNOME does high quality engineering, GNOME cares about the stack, GNOME takes responsibility for the user experience. Yeah, this is why Flatpak makes sense to GNOME. And unfortunately, it's not true of everybody else. Um, and as a distribution, we see that way too often. Um, and I, I don't want to throw too many different uh, upstream developers under too many buses, um, but there's way too many cases where we as a distribution are suddenly finding that upstream is doing crazy stuff that they shouldn't be, <coughs> and therefore we can't ship their stuff right away. It doesn't happen with GNOME, but it does happen with others, and I will, yeah, we'll give sort of more examples later. I think... Flathub might be the key to solving this problem. Because, you know, despite... It's just another distro, just another distro but that's the, the thing. It's, it's just another distro where you've got a chance to impose yeah. principles, quality standards, checking, etc. So if that's all done and done in a you know, relatively nice way, I know it ruins the nice, uh, you know, anyone can run their own Flathub story, but it does potentially make the whole thing, uh, you know, a lot more comfortable for people to use. And then, actually, on that, it's another distribution. I worry about the legal issues that come with Flatpak. I really worry about the legal issues that come with Flatpak. Um, and it, it really boils down to who is the distributor, you know, especially when it comes to licenses like the GPL. That's the big question. It's the distributor who is responsible for making sure that the GPL is complied with and making sure the source is available, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to Flathub, who is the distributor? Me. You. At the moment, yes. So you will be auditing everything in Flatup? No, I'm not massively happy with the situation, but it's, <laughs> it's a known issue. Yeah, and, and I'm I, glad I, it's I a I actually issue. completely agree with you, as in th there is this kind of implied distribution responsibility, and I used to be a Debian guy, I'm, yeah. I'm now a GNOME guy, I work at Endless, I yeah. get this. Yeah. I don't want to be yeah. doing it myself. Yeah, and we, um, need, we need an answer for this because it's terrifying, and especially with the bigger the runtimes are getting, so like with the current FDO runtime being you know, as huge as it is for good technical reason, everything in there needs to be checked, 
Because if you think of it, it comes from Yocto. Yocto's context is you know, a build environment, not a distributable dist you know, distribution. When we're doing our legal reviews at SUSE, there's tons of times where we're thinking, how is this actually going to be used? Because the terms and conditions slightly change if you're redistributing it for use or redistributing it for building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can't necessarily rely on you know, Intel to have done their job properly with Yocto. They're thinking in a different context. The flat hub flat pack context is a different one. I think everything needs to be reviewed again. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you're worrying about it because it, this terrifies me. And I think also it, it, it holds back the use of, of these tools in commercial environments as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we actually have some, some support from the GNOME Foundation to try to get legal advice. And Good. It, it's blocking on legal, taking forever as usual, but yeah. we are looking into it. I'm glad. Because I think I found one that terrified me while I was here. You mentioned in your presentation there's an NVIDIA driver flat pack now. There's a clause in the NVIDIA driver, a very annoying clause, because this is why I can't test the NVIDIA driver in OpenQA, where basically on your machine you're allowed to have one copy of the NVIDIA driver. Now, if you've installed the NVIDIA driver on your base operating system and then installed the flat pack, There's no Linux exception for this. Nope. I, I'm sad. I'm sorry. I double checked it while I was here. That's, yeah. That terrified. That's why I can't test it in OpenQA, because I want to run 20 copies of the thing at the same time on the same box. Yeah. Would be yeah, but yeah, but but, uh, but I think it's not a, it's not a clause about the redistribution. It's a clause about how many copies the user is allowed to have yeah, on their so machine. We're not doing wrong. So you're the not doing anything wrong, but the poor user has just broken the Nvidia license, and you've made it happen. Yeah. Every time a user uses the Nvidia license, they're breaking the kernel's license. Yeah. So it's like it's already. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. That's one reason why it isn't in any distributors of our don't care about this one. Oh, <laughs> they oh, it to oh the actually, user. Oh, actually, right. OpenSUSE does. We do not have the Nvidia driver anywhere near our repos because of stuff like this too. Um, yeah, so I'm you know, sure there was some kind of exception for pack for repackaging. No, but I, I, I might miss. It something. doesn't apply yeah. to this bit. I really yeah. wish it did because I'd be testing the Nvidia driver a lot more if it was. Um, yeah. Anyway. Really. Uh, yeah, uh, download.nvidia.com slash whatever the OpenSUSE repo is. Okay, that's interesting. They need to, uh, yeah. That's the one that applies to OpenSUSE users. For the people <laughs> watching the video, there's a suggestion Maybe from the audience like that the NVIDIA okay, driver then. has a different license than the one shown there. Brilliant. Cool. Um, yeah, so to kind of wrap everything up, you know, I, I don't want to see another DEB versus RPM split. You know, there's these three different technologies. I want only one of them to win, <laughs> really, person, you know. Um, and, you know, I'm a GNOME guy. I've been a GNOME guy as long as I've been an OpenSUSE guy. You know, I want it to be flat back. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's more sensible for desktop applications. I think there's more potential elsewhere. I like this, the sandboxing story more. But we've got to worry about these issues. We need to address them. A lot of them are stuff that the distributions already know. So, you know, this was a kind of plea for help and let's work together. And on that note, thank you very much. A statement, actually, uh, because in your early slides, a couple of times you said um, that app developers didn't have to worry about things because distro developers were worrying about them. Yes. Uh, security, packaging, that kind of thing. Um, I've written apps. I've written several apps, actually. Yep. Um, and not once has a distro maintainer magically appeared to worry about those things for me. <laughs> um, and when I go to distros and I say, hey, I have this app. I would like to get it in your archive. I get told, great. Here's where you go to learn all you need to know to be a distro maintainer, and then you can worry about it as a distro maintainer. So in a very narrow sense, you're right. But in the broader sense, for the majority of apps and app developers, mm -hmm. the app developer is already worrying about these things. And the mm -hmm. distro maintainers are not. So I, I in terms of scale, like to scale the process that you currently have, yeah to something that has as many apps as like the Play Store does, yeah. you just can't get there with that process. 
but is the goal to get that many, is the goal really to get just as many apps as possible in a Play Store, or is the goal to ship a comprehensive, consistent experience to the users? My goal is to get every app that a user yeah. wants on the distro. Yeah, because you know, there's, there's you know, different scales and scope there. Yeah, I mean, the, there is obviously a, a huge tension here, right? Because the, I think the, the goal of, let's say, Flatpak as a technology, and, and to some extent, Snap, and I'm just going to sort of slightly ignore App Image because it's not really a container format, it's a distribution format. So okay. it, it doesn't fit with the other two. Um, but the, the goal of, let's say, Flatpak is to redefine the problem at a higher level than our current solutions solve it. So this idea that um, predominantly you wish open source applications, which are widely used, such a distributor will then package them, solve the issues, and deliver them to a user, yep. is the bottleneck for having a Linux desktop app platform. What we're trying to do with Flatpak is to define these are the points. Like if you have these portals and you support containers and you have these couple of things, you can now run anything that can be distributed and containerized in a flat pack. You're right that the app developer has to worry about blah, which runtime do I use? Is it updated? Is it a good security thing? Is it built by Alex or is it built by you know, SUSE or OBS? Right? Yeah. You know, that's an app developer choice. Once they've made that choice, then they can rely on whatever they rely on yeah. and they have to solve their issues once <laughs> and then assuming that those hook-in points, the portals and the stuff work, their portability and their testability and repeatability is a million times better than it ever would be by sitting down and thinking, okay, how do I get it working on SUSE? How do I get it working on Fedora? How do I get it working on Debian? Like, oh, Arch, yeah, but, great. But <laughs> I guess my point is, and this is a very pessimistic point, and I hope the video isn't still recording, but who cares? I don't think most upstream developers do that thought process. You know, right now, they just, generally speaking, pick one platform of their choice right. and just deliver on that. And then the, every other distribution is every other distribution's problem. Wh which is, which uh, is why Flatpak has a default runtime and why if you ask any Flatpak developer, they'll tell you to use the free desktop one or do, if you must make a runtime, and there are very few people who should, yeah. like Gnome has a stack, KD has a stack, maybe Wine. You know, there's, like, there's a few more people who have a yeah. good reason to make a runtime yeah. that you want to say, please don't make more runtimes because we don't actually want this plurality of decision points and things. Yeah. Um, but even, I guess my point is, even with that limited set of runtimes, you with the flat pack model, you actually still got more stuff for the developer to worry about than they currently do now. I think it's a different set of stuff. And, and, but and, and it's, and it's a stuff that you worry about once and then... That's that's the goal. That's hopefully, but I, I you know, I, I you know, we I think there needs to be a nice, cleaner story with that. But I, I, I also think there's this unnecessary separation, unnecessary separation between upstream developer and distro people. Yeah, that isn't quite true, or doesn't have to be. I mean, historically, has been that way. That, I mean. I am both an upstream developer and I've been packaging Red Hat stuff for 17 years. I have a vague idea how, how packaging work. I, I know both of these and people who are only in one camp can get help from people who are maybe distro developers or used to be distro developers yeah. in the upstream. I mean, just like we have bug testers, we can have packagers in the upstream yeah. teams that are aware of these things. Yep. I, I don't think there's a divide no, that that's separates a fair, us. That's a fair like point. We're a community. We can. And we only have to do it once or, you know, three, if you had three packaging format, but or not. Five if you... Or per it. distro or whatever. Yeah. So <laughs> even though upstream would have to be m do more, the overall community work to package it is less. Yes. I can, I can, see, I can see that point. Yeah. In, indeed, what I see is... Um, First, I, th I think in, in my ignorance, I, uh, uh, the, the model of uh, developers uh, taking all the responsibility of the uh, cycle of life of their application is happening in, in Android and iPhone. So it's supposed not to be nothing new. Yeah. On the other hand, I completely agree with you about the, the Especially not on the, the quality assurance were made by distributions, but it's not the full job, but it's extraordinarily big job 
it's yeah. very, very important. And um, I, I know a few hands that a lot of developers didn't uh, uh, have this in mind. So um, for sure, if they want or, or, uh, to take the responsibility of the full cycle, they need to learn and to adopt these practices. Yeah. So what I, I think what you are suggesting too is uh, we need better tooling and methodology for, for helping them. On the other hand, all that experience that uh, distro and packagers uh, uh, have uh, collected uh, the last 20 years can be used or can be uh, reused, I think in, in the sense, uh, Alex said, contributing these quality assurance practices and methodologies upstream, yep. so you finally have less responsibilities, but maybe the same job, and maybe at, at the medium and long term, saving some job, because this, they are being reused. So I, I, I can be seeing, I, I can see all, all these contexts. What I don't know is, uh, because uh, I'm very new with the flat pack thing, etc., is there is tooling enough, as we have, uh, for example, in the RPM Fedora World, for example, because uh, I think it's similar, for all, having all the work done. I, I don't know. On the other hand, what is uh, uh, really complex, and, and, and I think you're talking about, uh, referring to, is how you express the or, or implement the, the equivalent of uh, the guidelines of Fedora, the BAM policy, etc., which define which the quality assurance should be in the legal, technical, whatever, how to, to express in, in Flat Hub or, or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either, but I hope we can figure it out. Um, and, and I think I think it's a we have to figure it out. Like it isn't, you know, it's not just Flatpak. Uh, I, you know, I think the distros need to be involved. I, I, I yeah, it, it has to. I mean, it, it's it's such a big problem. Thanks. Hi. Um, I think an important thing to consider is what will make it easiest for third-party developers who don't really care about Linux that much, but we can still make it easy for them to to package their apps such that we can use them in a nice way. Um, I, I get the feeling that that means they want to take little responsibility and therefore distros would have to take responsibility or flat hub would. Um, but then maybe they're already taking responsibility because they're distributing on Windows, for example. So uh, I, I guess which of, the, which of the options we have is best for that particular use case? I don't have a suggestion, but... <laughs> Good point. I, I can agree with you. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's like... All right, yeah, so this one is not, I get, I, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this because you're a desktop guy, but I was wondering, with regards to containers on like SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, Yep. do you have similar problems and how are you solving them there? We have similar concerns and, you know, we're market-led, so we have Docker. Um, and I actually have a wonderful bunch of slides about like the worst Docker container I've ever seen on a SUSE machine, um, which is actually right at the end of here because I was hoping it would come up. Um, you know, this, uh, <laughs> and yeah, this this is the madness of of you know this is the madness I want to avoid with Flatpak. You know, we uh, we don't want to end up in this world where we have users downloading some container that's just doing nothing but curling you know not just WordPress but then picking some random PHP uh, Docker container, which also just does nothing more than a random make of the entire of Apache and PHP in that container. And that's just relying on a Debian container. That but, uh, but I guess you, you also have uh, container uh, scanning on your server uh, enterprise uh, distribution. Yeah, we've, we've, we've got that for SUSE-based uh, containers. So if you take a SUSE host and put SUSE containers on it, um, we actually, you can patch right into those containers. Oh, and then, then you are uh, responsible for those yeah. customers' image. And we're responsible image, for that. And you, they have a contract, and they will trust you. Exactly, and, um, and therefore we're taking all of that responsibility, basically uh, taking the old-fashioned model and putting it all on ourselves, and just give, enabling them with the technology, which, uh, yeah, it works well enough right now, but doesn't work with what, st you know, with stuff like Flatpak. And you know, unless we want to take all of that on board, and it, that's it's duplicate work. I mean, I I don't like this as the answer for that either. I'd much you know, which is also one of the reasons why SUSE is investing so much on OCI, for example, because um, you know it might give us a chance to make crazy containers like this less likely. 
Yeah, sorry. Um, okay, um, I basically have two things to say. Uh, one is that um, I also, I'm a, I'm a Debian developer. So uh, when Flapper came up, I was very intrigued in just making a Flapper runtime that's based on Debian. Because uh, we as a distribution, we already do all the security checks, we do the, um, the license checking, and this is one of the things that was uh, for like making these large bundles that Flatpak does, these runtimes, that was really scaring me. So uh, I didn't do that yet because I think there's a lot of value in, in having one runtime instead of having thousands. But um, in general, I think basing this, these stuff, these things on a distribution does make some sense. So. Um, you need to trust someone, and whether that's Debian or whether that's Fedora, it's, it doesn't actually matter in, in the end. It just matters politically. So um, uh, I'm interested. Pol politics yeah. matter, and, and actually, like, like take, yeah. taking so off my community hat, for example, like thinking like a SUSE uh, enterprise engineer for a bit, like I can't see a SUSE enterprise customer trusting Flatpak right now because they won't know who to blame if something goes wrong. And you know that's what we make our money in right now. Um, I like the idea of Flatpak, you know, being part of that story somehow. We've just got to find a way of being able to answer those questions. Yeah, for like who to blame, it's a simple the application maintainer, I think, because they tested it with that particular runtime, and that particular runtime is not is supposed to not be changing in this yeah. case. But yeah, the other point I wanted to mention uh, is that um, for this point of that. Um, Upstreams make like really terrible bundles and bundle old stuff that has security issues yeah. and um, has like um, patch upstream code and embed things there. Um, I made a bundling system a few years ago, which uh, was uh, well planning to address this problem by making static checks before <laughs> building the bundle. So it was, for example, checking whether someone has embedded Zlib, and if it uh, was embedded, it was uh, suggested that they please use something from somewhere else. Yep. Or it was using metadata to check whether some embedded library had CVE issues that were known, and then was informing the person about it. And basically what it was doing, it was not building the package until those problems were addressed, which actually made it not very uh, fun to use for yep. people who just wanted yep. to get their stuff out. That made you so really unpopular really um, quickly. Yeah. I think <laughs> Something like this on the flat up side yeah. would make a lot of sense, and, uh, and but like going crazy with it, agreed. from my experience that I gained with this yeah. endeavor is that it, you it's shouldn't tough. And, and, and it's not just those technical examples you give as well. Like the, the worst example I can think of lately that, that really fed a lot of these fears in here, um, an up, a large major upstream who I will not name, but you know, they also do a desktop environment on Linux, gave OpenSUSE in their recent application release a bunch of tarballs that didn't comply with their own licenses in, that tar in those tarballs. Like, we couldn't ship that. And, and it's, it's that kind of madness that distribution shouldn't have to deal with it, but we do because it's our responsibility when we take that tarball and we distribute it. Yeah, I feel you. We are in Debian, I think, for most of the packages, um, I send something to upstream, so to please include the copy of the GPL or yeah. do some other minor tweaks or do not combine OpenSSL with GPL code and stuff like that. It's, exactly. yeah, it's super annoying. Yeah. There we go, sorry. Thank you. Do you have any mm, correlation or any sort of idea? I'm thinking, if I'm an application writer, I almost certainly want to depend on a certain runtime, like the GNOME 3.26 runtime, because it's, you know, all the standard libraries I require, and maybe two or three special libraries that only my application requires, or only my application and a few others. One of those libraries may even be a library that I developed myself just for my application, and that I happen to release to the general public in case they want to to write something similar, right? Yep. I'm thinking, you know, the GIMP, the GIMP requires probably things up to GTK, mm -hmm. probably not much from the GNOME, from the rest of the GNOME stack, but it requires Gaggle, Gaggle requires Babel. Yep. So it's like a couple of special libraries, and recently I've been playing with QGIS, and QGIS will require sub to Qt, maybe not very much from the rest of the KDE stack, and a few of the, you know, geographical, geospatial libraries that everyone uses. Yeah. So, my question goes around, do you have an idea of how often 
do we require patches or security updates for the big stacks that would be in the runtimes versus the small diverse libraries that are required by only a handful of applications. Is there some way to? Uh, not really. I mean, the 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 tr the problem with that is, I mean, you've you've got the kind of you've got the security issues which require you know, the package to be rebuilt, but then of course you've got the kind of whole dependency chain of you know some change in some lower layer library then you know requires a rebuild of you know stuff that's dependent on it. You know, which is you know what we're doing in the build service all the time with OBS of you know rebuilding a whole stack just because some some ABI API changed lower down. Um, so you know we hit that exponentially. So if you want to make sure that you know that everything is built and integrated consistently, you know you're hitting this with with minor issues you know every other day with you know everything but the e furthest end leaf of your distribution. But how much of that is like actually relevant and going to hurt somebody in the real world? Yeah, maybe ten percent of the time. Then plus this unknown number of you know the security issues. It's probably yeah. You've you've got the kind of you've got the kind of two issues of how much is this a real world technical problem and just how much of it is building something in a sane and consistent way so you hopefully avoid those technical problems. M my my feeling. Uh, I, I'm not an application developer, but from the applications I use, the, the feeling I get is that they develop against a certain version of a major stack like GNOME or KDE or something. They hope that it won't change yeah. incompatibly. And if they do well, they'll do something about that. Yeah. And they, they stick to a particular version, right? But they track those special libraries very, very closely because it's very close to their core competence, you know? Yeah. So the GIMP developers are the Gaggle developers. The QGIS developers depend on the latest yeah. lib, geo, whatever. Yeah. So it's like they stick to this big thing and hope it doesn't change. They track these things very closely and they may even be changing them yep. themselves. So uh, pff, I, I don't know if, I mean, it sounds to me like Flatpak would allow you to do exactly that, to stick to a, a basic uh, uh, runtime, which distros can handle very responsibly, but then let the app developers worry more about the really special things they require. Yep. And distros, I mean, when you, when one of those big applications is not available in the default repositories for OpenSUSE, for example, and I need to go look for either some nerd who has packaged them up in their own personal yep. OBS repository, or maybe a, we, we have the uh, OpenSUSE Geo yep. project, which takes care of packaging all these things. But they are not never fully up to date. No. Nope. Um, so it, it's kind of frustrating when upstream releases something and I cannot use it here immediately. Totally. Uh, but the 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 kind of the unknown there, I think, is which one is actually less work. You know, having someone build an old school RPM or having someone build a flat pack with with that thing. Like at the moment, my feeling is it's f about a wash. It's about the same amount of work. Now that's fine if the flat pack is you know totally portable on every single distribution. You've saved yourself a bunch of work because you don't have to do it on OpenSUSE and on Debian and on whatever. But yeah, is is it really a net saving at the moment? Because you know, with the portability sort of in question somewhat, and with like the build service where we can build all of OpenSUSE Geo on Debian like we do already, you know, th there's there's different ways of tackling that problem. And uh, you know, this uh, the you know the dream would be to make packaging a, a problem of the past. I don't see that happening. It's just going to be a different set of problems for a different set of users. But he might have a totally different opinion. I expect he might. I, I mean, I'd like to s uh, stop this because I think we're over. Yeah, we've gone way over. So on, on a completely different note, and I think, I think Flatpak. Yeah, it tends to be in in a competition kind of thing where, where where I am Flatpak against distribution, and that is just not true. I mean, I, I think. I think distributions as a phenomena 
has a lot to gain by having Leaf apps packaged outside of distributions because I think distributions should not be about packaging 50,000 Leaf packages, but around creating a really rock solid core, the experience when you log in, well, I mean, if, it's, if it's a workstation, the experience when you log into everything just works together and who cares about who packaged the geospatial whatever. Yeah. It, it, it just shouldn't be part of creating a great operating system. And I think the kind of competition we could have in the distro space when everybody doesn't have to package everything and can instead focus on interest, interesting new stuff, interesting new ideas, things like Atomic or, or just yep. general like OS work instead of boring packaging work. I can agree with that, yeah. I think the, the other point is that there's, there's kind of one hypothesis in your talk that this will weaken the ability of the distributor to say, here is a quality bar, I stand by everything I'm distributing to you. Yes. And the point is, yes, right, this technology is to circumvent that bar, it's to disintermediate yeah. the end user from the yeah. app developer, yeah. which is a very, very, it's a double-edged sword, right? 90% yeah. of everything is crap. Most of the things in Docker <laughs> Hub are complete rubbish. They're insecure, they're lousy, yep. right? But the popular ones will gain more effort, more attention, more users, yep. and they will be better. But the thing is that as a platform, and uh, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, right? If we have more applications that target Linux or the Linux desktop, and we can actually run that, and we can argue the toss on OBS versus Koji or whatever, but it doesn't really matter, right? As long as we've got a system where people can target and gain the whole ecosystem. And at the moment, needing some guy who likes making RPMs to get your, you know, QJS or whatever thing built on this distro for you, for this guy to use your application, stops that from happening. It stops Michael from making his app and getting it out there, right? So we are disintermediating, disintermediating distributions, but to Alex's point that that helps everyone, right? Mm. As long as we capture the right responsibility, right? So the distribution things, the, you know, the linting to tech, you haven't yeah. got 12 old Z libs and yeah. the SSL is up to date or whatever. That stuff, like maintaining a runtime is basically maintaining a distro. So this is where we can collaborate and make sure that we're not kind of giving away the whole farm. There's part of me where I agree, but I don't want to keep these guys any longer. So we'll talk <laughs> later. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.